I was actually sitting at my desk at work. Congratulations, we're offering you a staff writer position on The Amanda Show. This was like a dream come true. I had been in LA for seven years. Um, someone was gonna pay me to write comedy. And she said that I was going to have to split a salary with a writer that I did not know. And have them share a salary. And I never saw it happen to any of the men. It was my dream job <laughs> down. I thought to myself, don't be a complainer. Paramount Law, which was very exciting. My first week on the job, I got to meet my writing partner. Chrissy's very easy to get along with. Is were great. They were great. Said he didn't think women were funny. Female writer. And he said this to the writers in the writer's room. He didn't really value women in the writer's room. Stan the girls. Are the girls in the room? Where are the girls? Stan girls that are uptight about things like that. Next time this guy asked me if I mind something, there's a right and wrong answer. And thank God I answered right. He was there anytime we were doing any work. And joke around and being dirty was part of the silliness. Look you take. Um, is a character that Dan created. The taint is the part of the body that's between the penis and the anus is hell. <laughs> what this word really means. And saying like, oh, does this mean? I remember someone from Nickelodeon sitting with us and saying, was like, no, why would you think that's like tainted, like you've tainted something? And they were like, okay, man, that is power. It's done. One of those things where it's like, oh, you know, like, yeah. Scene. You know, she's praying a sexualized genitalia joke with a little girl who's portraying a little girl, too. It was clear that there was a permissibility around the... One time, Dan said, I'll give you $300 to eat two pints of ice cream in 30 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, I've got no money. I've got half a salary. I will absolutely eat two pints of ice cream in 30 minutes. And I did. And um, I was throwing up afterwards, but it was fine. I'm reviewing every episode of the series called Quiet on Set. The Dark Side of Kids TV premiered on Investigation Discovery in 2024. It was supposed to reveal what it was like working in children's particularly teen television in the 90s and 2000s, specifically on shows created by Dan Schneider. I showed those two particular clips in the beginning because those are the main ones I had a problem with out of the whole series, mostly because I had a problem with the actual people telling these anecdotes, not the people they're discussing. One thing I can say is that, a big question mark hovering over these alleged incidents that saturate the professional and amateur internet and social media and sometimes even the news, is, sure these events happened, but why is there so much silence from the fellow actors and staff, mostly the actors and actresses? considering they were considered to be the fucking victims themselves and should speak out. Or should have spoken out. Or just quit, etc. The first episode is mainly about former writers on The Amanda Show. So episode 1, a female writer for The Amanda Show said it was fine to be blackmailed for money where Dan said he'd pay her to eat two pints of ice cream in a short amount of time. She said she threw up eating all that ice cream, but then she said it was fine quote, and she smiles while telling the story. It's problematic on its own that she thinks it's necessary to even state that two pints of ice cream would make her throw up, which, in my eyes, minimizes or, on the contrary, glamorizes eating disorders by saying it's fine that she threw up after eating. But it at the very least, clearly states she was fine being mistreated by Dan. These female writers stayed at a job where they were paid, quote, no money or had, quote, no money. One female writer said, eh, to learning that taint was a sexual part of the female anatomy which one of Amanda Bynes's characters was named after when she was a child. They laughed off Dan being, quote, dirty as a sense of humor for a kid's TV show, saying it's normal on their set. But we want this to be about, is the children. We as viewers want to know if there's anything about children regarding this man, and for two-thirds of the first episode so far, it's just about the victimization of his grown female writing staff, you know, the ones who laughed off a child having taint in their character's name. They clearly know this was wrong what they did, the part they played, otherwise, they wouldn't be trying to justify it, though by shifting blame on Dan of course. Not saying they are lying about how Dan made them feel, but certainly shifting the blame regardless. You stayed in a job where you were paid a pittance, and so far there's just not much tea regarding how he treated them, just loose anecdotes that he was mean. I'm sure it will get juicier, but so far, mean is the worst they could say about Dan, but, eh, 
is the most they've so far said about the sexualization of youth in this poorly paid job. Like, hypocritical as it might be, but if you're going to do something that you are sitting here saying troubled you that you were intimidated by Dan into doing, you better be getting paid something that makes it a bit more worth it. But you did it for peanuts, makes it worse. That character means, you do immoral or even illegal things, for free. This big, grown, old woman's worst thing she can say Dan did or said to her, so far in this episode, is that he threatened that she'll never work for Nickelodeon again if she speaks out against him. At this point, you're writing quote dirty jokes for children, and quote, have no money, and quote, threw up during one of Dan's pranks. It seems like not working for him or the network is a good thing for you. But to her, this is a threat. And to her, this is justification for staying and writing these jokes that these people have held onto, as they say, made them suffer after all these years. She also states, quote, the worst thing she's ever seen happen to a woman in their workplace with Dan, is her fellow female writer performing a dirty joke in a boardroom full of men, and Dan. Sure, it's pretty bizarre. But it's certainly just not that great of a cup of tea, sorry. But again, this is these female writers trying their best to make it seem like they were enslaved to write for a monster, and thus that's why they wrote traumatizing skits and or stayed in a traumatizing workplace. Because Dan was mean. And surely they never mentioned during these interviews, if he did this to me, a grown woman, what was he doing to young girls? They still don't care about these kids. It's not just Dan. She then cries, saying, it was hard to let go of that job. She thinks this is a tear-jerking story. She also thinks, that job, the one where she wasn't paid and was about to work for free partially to write perverted jokes for children, was a job she was devastated to let go of. Something's missing. Either, that job wasn't paid a pittance at all and they're really just lying about Dan and the network to make you feel bad for them of all people. And or, they are telling the truth, but what's missing is their morality. Her breaking point was pay, rather than the real reasons we came to this series, which is how children were treated. The series also showed introductory moments of the fame and celebrity of the child and teen stars of these shows directed, written or created by Dan Schneider. I personally just don't think people were really even fans of Amanda Bynes, especially these kids at these shows such as Slime Time Live and the awards shows. I think these kids felt, if she could be a famous kid, so can I. They screamed during these awards shows and live events, because of vicarious desires to be seen and to be made famous too. I guarantee that. Because no one, sorry to say, seems to care about Amanda Bynes now. The first 10 minutes of episode 2 are just lame. People are literally saying there are murky details, and they show moments of Schneider's responses to the interviews during the filming of the docuseries. So I'm already losing interest in this, but the best he so far during the episode is that teens who emancipate from their parents in the industry might do it naively, thinking freedom would be better for them since their parents are probably their managers, but it really seems, according to the documentary, to expose the teens to now, adult-like work schedules. Emancipating benefits no one, except the TV show staff. That's all I got out of it. The series showed a clip where the kids of all that said in a skit that Dan is a god. So another interesting thing, is that Dan writes himself into powerful positions, lording it over youth, which at the very least, if not problematic or illegal or immoral, is certainly just pathetic. Brian Hearn grew to be a very sexy guy. However, it soon devolved into a talk on Dan being racist. They're also showing that parents are aware, but quite easily can be shut up. Another thing is that an actress from All That clearly finds it a laughing matter discussing a convicted offender against the underage cast members, major and extra cast. Just what I noticed. Everyone else is serious and solemn, even tearful, and she's smiling and laughing. It could be her personality but it's tone deaf and annoying. Another thing is that when they describe the felony acts of this convicted staff member, among other convicted or suspected staff members, it just basically shows that the network and Schneider simply didn't conduct thorough background checks. Average employers big and small send your basic contact info to third-party background check sites, who on behalf of the company for a small fee, contact the employee's local court for any files on this person. In fact, the average civilian can go to the court and get documents on their own and provide it to the employer. It's basically very easy. 
For large employers, however, they use a company to do that stuff for them because it's time-consuming to do it for hundreds of employees, yet these background checks typically still happen for cheap within a few days. There's really no reason why it seems the network just didn't do it, particularly with minors being the majority of the workplace. It is nice to see, however, that just not many cast members seem to have anything to say regarding these sexual allegations. The people being interviewed are oblivious, supposedly. There could be a code of silence that they've perfected over what's decades now. And they're actors. Or, they really are just fucking oblivious, which makes this docuseries even more pointless, almost insultingly pointless like, this isn't funny. We're being serious. There are convicted offenders around you, multiple, and you guys to this day, are deers in headlights. Just stop. Episode 3 rolls around, and I'm like, at this point, the series on Wendy Williams was better, and that was a horseshit show. This episode covers Drake and Josh and at this point, we already know what happened because thirsty ass big YouTubers and TikTokers have no chill and revealed the spoiler before the fucking series even aired, and handled this issue way less than delicately. But okay. Everything changed with Brian one morning. Point on. Sleeping on the couch where I would usually sleep. And I woke up to him. Uh, he was, uh, he was sexually assaulting me. And I froze and was in, or how to react. You know, when I call my mom and be like, hey, I had no car. I mean, and so it just became this, this secret that I had held on. People have also been literally saying that the Drake and Josh show was created as a penance for assaults. Which, based on this documentary, is just not true. The show was offered only amid Drake Bell's dad's concerns about an offender. There was nothing discussed so far that literally stated Bell was assaulted, a stink was made, and the show was gifted to quell that stink. I'm not saying it didn't happen that way, but that's how this docuseries was sequenced. So either the docuseries sucks and it's screwing with the truth and the tabloids are true. Or, the docuseries is accurate and the tabloids suck. Either way, I didn't really learn anything watching this. However, Drake Bell blatantly says he was victimized by a staff member while 15, in between acting jobs, but apparently after already being offered Drake and Josh, and after basically emancipating from his dad. I point this out because, even my interest with this series, is that it would be revealed that minors prostituted themselves, to get TV shows and gigs. I'm not saying they didn't, but so far, it's not seeming like that. What is interesting though, is that we can begin to say that these youth we are seeing in these shows, have been through what Drake Bell says he has been through, amid auditions or filming periods. So it does suck that while we were watching Drake and Josh, behind the scenes was clouded with this darkness. It's almost devastating to know that we were duped as viewers this whole time and thought everything was perfect. Episode 4 focuses more on Dan Schneider. The first three episodes were, well I'm not quite sure, what the purpose was of those. But episode 4 is about the stuff we kind of already know, if you've ever heard anything about Schneider, Jamie Lynn Spears and her show Zoe 101, if you know anything about Sam and Kat and Jeanette McCurdy and Victorious. Now, absolutely nothing. Zero things. Will make me never again laugh at Victorious and not love that show. I never, ever let the kids in my family watch the other shows like iCarly and stuff, but not because of these controversies since I didn't know back then like the rest of us. It was just beauty standards reasons and not wanting them to want to be skinny and stuff and wear makeup. But Victorious, I let them watch. And as adults, we still watch it, and we laugh. Sorry. It's just true, I'm sorry. But this episode is about those shows, and the innuendos of Schneider. But this documentary is just revealing old tea. We know this stuff about the feet, the splued shots on the face, the phallic simulation stuff with food items, the moments of boob expansion, etc. Everyone wants to come for Schneider however. 
but when will we come for the cast members, who were older teenagers even grown aged during episodes being filmed like 16 plus at least with Victorious? They had really skinny girls to look younger, but they were 16 to 19 from what I remember. So they weren't so oblivious. That's also why, to be honest, I still watch Victorious. Because, at least in this case, the cast weren't vulnerable little children and younger teens like 15 under, like the other shows. But the documentary doesn't even get into the best tea, better tea about these innuendos that amateurs on the internet have compiled better than this professional, well-budgeted production. The documentary clearly has omitted a lot of stuff, the documentary has skipped from saying Dan can't be blamed, and the worst he did was be mean, and skipped to his departure from the network. I'm sure the departure has a lot of behind-the-scenes reasons that not even this documentary will unfold since clearly they're consulting with Schneider during the entire production of this docuseries. But from what this docuseries put together, I can say, there was just no fucking point to it. The juiciest bit, if we can call it that, was episode 3 about Drake Bell. The series, in total, brought five former cast members, who had no tea. At all. The series brought two female writers, who are horrible people, or certainly were back then regarding the Amanda show. The series brought nothing. I've seen better shit on YouTube. 